The lecture today is about the reciprocal lattice and some diffraction phenomena. Uh, I will go through some elementary vector algebra first. So this is our unit cell and the unit cell is defined by the three basis vectors A1, A2 and A3 and directions within that unit cell are defined by the components that that particular direction has with respect to A1, A2 and A3 and therefore we get the indices of that direction. Now a plane on the other hand is defined by its normal and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So a vector u has a direction given by the indices here and it has a certain magnitude u. Now if I take the dot product of the vector u with another non-collinear vector which has a unit magnitude, so v hat, then that dot product is written as the magnitude of u times the cos of the angle between these two vectors. Now if you look at this picture, this is the vector u and this is the vector v and there's an angle theta between that. If I take u cos 30 then that is simply the projection of the vector u along the unit vector v hat. Okay? So u dot v hat is simply the projection of u along the vector v. In the cross product um, we actually get a vector at, as the result whereas a dot product is a scalar product. So A1 cross A2 results in a vector that is at 90 degrees to both A1 and A2. Uh, so let's assume that A3 here is a unit vector. Its magnitude will be given by A1, A2 sine theta. So this is A1, A2, and if I use a right-handed cross product, then that gives me a vector that is normal to both A1 and A2 and its magnitude is given by this term here, which is in fact the area enclosed by the vectors A1 and A2. So the cross product gives us a vector that is at 90 degrees to both of the components of the cross product and the magnitude of that vector is the area enclosed by A1 and A2. So just to emphasize that a bit more, if I take the product between A2 and A3, I get a vector that is normal to the plane and the magnitude of that vector is the area of that plane. Okay, okay. now um, so this is the area enclosed by A2 and A3. If we now uh, look at this three-dimensional cell where we have uh, the basis vectors a1, a2, a3 and the angle here is theta, then the height of this parallel pipette is given simply by taking the projection of a1 along v hat, in other words a1 dot v hat, that gives me the height. The area of the base is given by a2 cross A3 and that will result in a vector that is normal to this plane. So this is the area of the base and V, uh, the vector V hat into this product gives us A2 cross A3. Therefore this whole uh, operation is the same as saying A1 dot A2 cross A3. A1 dot A2 cross A3. So that gives us the volume of this parallel pipette because the height times the area gives us the volume. Okay, so uh, we are going to define a new frame of reference uh, where this is our, our vectors in real space, A1, A2, A3, and we define another vector A1 star which is normal to both A2 and A3 and has a magnitude which is one upon the spacing of 
these planes here. Okay, so A1 star is A2 cross A3, A2 cross A3, so it points normal to both of these vectors, and it's divided by the volume. So area divided by volume gives you uh, one upon the spacing of these planes, in other words, one upon the height. Okay, so this is what we call a reciprocal lattice vector because it has a magnitude one upon a length. It points normal to the vectors a1, a2. That means it's normal to this plane here, uh, to this plane here. And its magnitude is given by one upon the spacing of these planes here, okay? So A1 star is equal to A2 cross A3 divided by the volume of that cell. And A2 cross A3 has the area of the plane, therefore area divided by volume gives me a dimension which is one upon length. So just as we've defined uh, A1 star, uh, we can define A2 star and A3 star, where A2 star is A3 cross A1, divided by the volume and its magnitude uh, will be one upon the spacing of these planes here. And its direction will be not at 90 degrees to, to that plane. And similarly, a three star uh, will have a magnitude which is the um, one upon the spacing of these planes here. And its direction will be normal to both a1 and A2. These, these, are, uh, these terms here simply represent the volume of the cell. It doesn't really matter what order you do this operation in because the end product is a volume, a scalar quantity. So A1, A2, A3 are said to define the unit cell in real space and A1 star, A2 star, and A3 star define the unit cell in reciprocal space. And you might wonder why we are doing all this. It will become very clear shortly because the Miller indices of a plane are the components of a vector in reciprocal space. In other words, defined relative to A1 star, A2 star, and A3 star. So, that vector has a magnitude which is one upon the spacing of the HKL planes, and its direction is normal to the HKL planes. Now, just a word of caution that in general, uh, A1 star and A2 star don't, uh, don't point in the same direction as A1 and A2. So this is an oblique cell here, and A1 is along here, and A2 is along here, but A1 star will be normal to this plane here, and therefore it points that way. And A2 star is normal to this plane here, so it points in this direction. Of course, if it's a cubic system, then A1 star will be parallel to A1, and A2 star will be parallel to uh, A2. But in general, they will not be parallel. So the basis vectors of the reciprocal lattice are not necessarily parallel to those of the real space lattice. Now a reciprocal lattice vector is normal to a plane and has a magnitude one upon d where d is the spacing of those planes. Uh, and I've already explained that the Miller indices of that plane represent the components of that reciprocal lattice vector relative to a1 star, a2 star and a3 star. Now this is a, use, a useful set of identities that a i star dot a j is equal to one when i is equal to j, but is equal to zero when i does not equal to j. So that's very, very easy for you to prove. So this is the definition of a one star, that is a two cross a three divided by the volume. Now, this results in a vector which is at 90 degrees to a two and a three. So if I take a1 star dot a2, since this is at 90 degrees to these two, the dot product would be zero. In other words, when i does not equal j, the dot product is zero, okay? And when I have a dot product with a1, 
uh, so that i equals j, then a1 star dot a1 is exactly one because a1 dot a2 um, cross a3 divided by a1 dot a2 cross a3 gives you one. Okay, so these are useful identities to have. Now, what we are going to do is construct sections of the reciprocal lattice. So just like the real lattice, the reciprocal lattice is three-dimensional set of imaginary points, okay? So this is our, our cubic diagram, and I want to construct a reciprocal lattice section that is normal to 0, 0, 1. So 0, 0, 1 is pointing out of the plane of the diagram. So uh, the reciprocal lattice vectors are plane normals, and on this stereographic projection, we are plotting poles, in other words, plane normals. So if O1 is pointing out of the plane of the board, then our reciprocal lattice section on O01 will contain all the reciprocal lattice vectors in the perimeter because all these are at 90 degrees to 0, 0, 001. Okay. If we look at this stereographic projection and pick any reciprocal lattice vectors, let's say 100. 0, 0, and we plot an origin here with OO1 pointing out of the plane of the board and another point which is located one upon the spacing of these planes uh, and then pick a second uh, vector from here and let's say we pick uh, 0 bar 1 0 uh, which is at 90 degrees to this then we plot that again here's 0 bar 1 0 and the spacing of these planes is identical to that so these vectors are equal and at 90 degrees. Now, once we have labeled two of these, all the others follow by linear combination because this is a plane uh, and you only need two vectors to define everything in the plane. Uh, so if I add this and this, I get one bar one zero and, and so on. So this is the zero zero one reciprocal lattice section of a primitive cubic system. Now let's look at another um, <coughs> section. So this time we are going to plot the section normal to 110, all the points in the reciprocal lattice that are normal to 110. So they will obviously lie on this great circle because all of these are at 90 degrees to 110. If you take a dot product between any two of these, then you will get zero. So here is the section. I pick uh, an arbitrary um, vector, one, uh, zero, zero, one here. And the spacing here is one upon the spacing of these planes. And then I pick another convenient pole, in this case, bar one, uh, one, zero, which is at 90 degrees, but its spacing is smaller than of the O01 plane. So in reciprocal lattice, this distance is larger because we are plotting one upon the spacing. Okay, So this is in fact one over root two times uh, this distance here. This spot is simply a linear combination of these two. So this would be bar one, one, one. Okay, here's bar one, uh, sorry, here's bar one, 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 which is a combination of this and this. So this is the 110 reciprocal lattice section. Uh, remember that the reciprocal lattice is a three-dimensional set of points and a vector from the origin to, the po to that point, uh, to each point represents uh, the normal to that plane and uh, a magnitude which is one upon the spacing of that plane. Okay, uh, we'll now plot the section normal to the one on one um, plane normal. And everything that is at 90 degrees to one on one will appear on that pattern. And notice that these are all of the same, same form. So the spacings are identical for all of these planes. And the angles here are 60, 60, 60. So, here is what the pattern would look like. This is the origin, 
we pick any particular vector and another one at 60 degrees to it and the problem is solved. Everything else comes from a linear combination of these two vectors and the angle here is 60 degrees. The magnitude of each vector is one upon the spacing of, of that plane. So that is how we construct reciprocal lattice sections. At the moment, these are just imaginary objects. Later on, uh, when we put atoms onto our structure, we get intensities at these locations. But first I need to sort of briefly go through the Bragg law. So the Bragg law uh, is that an integer times lambda equals 2d sine theta. If that law is satisfied, then you will get diffracted intensity. So here's a set of incident uh, rays and these are the lattice planes spaced a distance d apart, and these are the reflected rays. And the incident and reflected rays will interfere with each other. Uh, the angle here is theta. So the path difference between an incident uh, beam and a diffracted beam is given by xy plus yz. And xy is simply a sine of theta here, um, is equal to this over the hypotenuse, which is basically the despacing. Okay, so this much is um, d sine theta. So if the sum of x, y, and y, z is equal to exactly 2d sine theta, um, and you can have an integer here, then these will interfere constructively and I can illustrate that. So this is the wave from the first first layer here and because we are satisfying the Bragg equation uh, when I substitute uh, for this plane here it will come exactly one wavelength out of phase. You can see this is exactly one wavelength out of phase and that means they interfere constructively and similarly from the third layer, this is exactly one wavelength out of phase with this and two wavelengths out of phase with this. So every single ray that is reflected from the crystal at the Bragg orientation will interfere constructively. Now supposing that the beam is not coming exactly at the Bragg angle theta, so it doesn't quite satisfy this equation, then let's see what happens. So here is a case where the angle phi is not quite equal to the angle, the Bragg angle theta. In other words, the path difference x, y plus y, z is not equal to an integral number of wavelengths. So the beam that's reflected from the top plane will be out of phase with that reflected from the second plane here and that reflected from the third plane will be out of phase with this one. So as we go down the depth of the crystal, uh, eventually you will encounter a beam that is exactly half a wavelength out of phase with this, and therefore they will interfere destructively. Okay. So if the deviation from the Bragg angle is very small, then you will get some diffracted intensity around the Bragg angle, but you'd have to go quite a lot of depth into the crystal to find that wave, which is exactly half a wavelength out of phase. So this raises an interesting point that you will get diffracted intensity when uh, away from the Bragg angle, if your crystal is very thin because you may not be able to find a wave which is half a wavelength out of phase with the incident beam on the top surface simply because there isn't sufficient depth to the crystal. Okay? So when, when the crystals are thin in whatever dimension, they will not exactly satisfy the Bragg equation. You will pick up intensity, diffracted intensity, around the exact Bragg angle. Okay, um, 
this diagram, I'm going to simplify a little bit. Um, so we have a incident beam, we have a diffracted beam, and the angle between the incident beam and the diffracted beam is two theta. You can see that clearly. And this is the normal to the diffracting planes. So the normal to the diffracting planes uh, bisects the um, incident beam and the reflected beam. So if I draw this diagram slightly differently, these are my set of diffracting planes. This is the incident beam. And uh, the diffracted beam would normally be drawn like this, but I've chosen to draw them from the same origin. So this is the diffracted beam, and therefore this angle is theta. And this is our plane normal. So it's, it's no different from this diagram, except I'm placing these vectors at the same origin here, for example. Okay, so this would be the diffracted beam and the normal pointing towards that diffracted beam. Now, in electron diffraction, uh, we use quite a, a, a quite a high accelerating voltage. It's uh, 100 kilo electron volts or more, in which case the wavelength of the electrons is really small compared with X-rays. So a typical X-ray wavelength might be 0.2 nanometers, whereas this is orders of magnitude smaller. Now, if you substitute that into the Bragg equation uh, for a typical D-spacing, then you would find that the Bragg angle is actually very small. It's 0.5 degrees. So this here, would be just one degree. And this vector would become almost at 90 degrees to the incident beam. Not quite at 90 degrees, but almost at 90 degrees. Okay, now I'm going to show you a construction which helps us to understand diffraction a bit better, but in reciprocal space. So I want to present to you the Bragg equation in reciprocal space. Uh, so we define, first of all, a vector K which represents the incident beam and the vector k dash, which represents the diffracted beam. And both of them have the same magnitude because we are working in reciprocal space, it's the magnitude one upon <coughs> the wavelength. And we represent the planes by a reciprocal vector, uh, lattice vector G, which has a magnitude one upon the spacing and points at 90 degrees to the particular plane to which it refers. Now, if I draw a sphere, which has a radius one upon lambda and place my incident beam so that it points to the origin of the reciprocal lattice here, so this incident beam is pointing towards the origin of the reciprocal lattice and this sphere here in three dimensions would have the radius one upon the wavelength. And this is the origin of the reciprocal lattice. Uh, K dashed, if it touches this G vector, which is normal to the particular diffracting planes and has a magnitude one upon the spacing of those planes, if it touches that, then I want to show you that uh, this satisfies the Bragg condition. So uh, if I take K dashed here and I remove K, that means minus K pointing this way here. And if that is equal to G, then Bragg, uh, the Bragg law is satisfied. Because look, if I take sine of theta here, uh, then sine of theta is half the magnitude of G divided by uh, the magnitude of K, which is one upon lambda. So sine theta becomes 0.5 over D, okay? And this is one upon lambda, and if you rearrange that, you will get uh, the Bragg equation, which is 2D sine theta equals lambda. Now, just to repeat, if I have a construction in which I represent the incident beam by a vector k pointing towards the origin of the reciprocal lattice and of magnitude one upon lambda. And this is a, a vector representing the reciprocal 
um, lattice vector for a particular set of planes. Uh, in other words, it's normal to those planes and it has a magnitude one upon the spacing of those planes. If the diffracted beam touches that vector, then the Bragg law is satisfied. So if I impose the Ewald sphere onto the reciprocal lattice, uh, first of all, with the incident beam pointing to the uh, origin and then draw a sphere, then everywhere that sphere touches a reciprocal lattice point will lead to diffracted intensity. So here is an example. So this is the origin of the reciprocal lattice. This is the orientation of the incident beam relative to the crystal. This is a G vector for the 101 planes. And you can see that K dash touches that and therefore Bragg condition is satisfied for that. However, in this case, it is not because K dash does not touch this reciprocal lattice point or any of these. So we would pick up diffracted intensity from uh, 101 and from 10 one bar 1, but not from 00, zero bar 1, etc. Okay. Okay, uh, let's now look at electron diffraction patterns by uh, placing. Okay, now let's look at some electron diffraction patterns by putting intensity onto those reciprocal lattice points. So th this is a projection of the cubic, pre, uh, cubic P uh, crystal structure. And uh, we constructed the reciprocal lattice uh, section normal to the OO1 axis, which looked like this, but we've now weighted it with intensities the transmitted beam is the most intense here. And uh, basically this resembles completely the reciprocal lattice section that we constructed. Now, if you look at cubic F, uh, it also looks like a, a square pattern here, but notice that I've indexed this as two zero zero rather than one zero zero. And the reason for that is that if I look at the 100 planes, okay, here, for example, are the 100 planes, then I can find atoms in the middle of those two planes, which will scatter exactly half a wavelength out of phase. So for the cubic F system, you will not pick up 001 reflections, but you will get reflections from the 002 planes, which have half the spacing and therefore this distance here will be one upon two D if D is the spacing of the zero zero one planes. Okay. So the zero zero one reflection is missing. And similarly we will not get a one one zero but we will get a two two zero reflection because if I um if I look at the 110 planes, uh, there are these planes here. Oh dear. Okay, now we are going to construct electron diffraction patterns by putting intensities onto the reciprocal lattice points. Now, in the case of the cubic P system here, um, the shape will look exactly as in the reciprocal lattice section that we created. It's a square pattern here and the indexing is exactly the same. I mean, the intensity of the transmitted beam is usually greater than that of the diffracted beams. So this is a projection of the cubic P lattice. Uh, now, this is for the cubic F system. 
And notice that the one zero zero reflections are missing as are the one one zero reflections. Instead, we have two zero zero, zero two zero, and two two zero. Now, the reason for this is as follows, that if I, um, if I look at the one zero zero planes, then exactly halfway along, we have these atoms which diffract exactly half a wavelength out of phase with any beams reflected from these planes. So there will be destructive interference and we will not get intensity from the one zero zero planes. And therefore, the first reflection to occur will be two zero zero. On a, a similar light, um, we will not get any reflections from the one one zero planes. So these are the one one zero planes. because exactly halfway between the 110 planes, we have these atoms which will uh, generate beams, reflected beams, which are half a wavelength out of phase from the 110 plane. Therefore, we have a missing reflection here, which is the two, uh, which is the 110. Instead, we get a 220 reflection. Okay. Um, this is now the section normal to the 011 plane, uh, 011 uh, normal. And um, this is for the primitive lattice where you recall we had a rectangular pattern, but the same uh, beam direction gives us a different shape in the case of the cubic app, because we no longer have the 100 uh, reflection and we no longer have the 0, 1, 1, we would get 0, 2, 2, and 1, 0, 0. So these are missing. And therefore, the pattern appears as not quite a hexagonal shape because uh, these vectors are not all identical, but a sort of a squashed hexagon. Because of this missing reflections, if they were not missing, then we would get a rectangular pattern as in the cubic P. This is now uh, the beam going along the 111 direction, uh, and you see the reflections from the 011 planes in the primitive cubic, but from the 022 type planes in the case of the cubic F, for reasons we've already discussed. Now, I illustrated the fact that we do not get reflected intensity from these planes here by saying that, look, I can find atoms in between them, which would give diffracted intensity half a wavelength out of phase, and therefore those reflections would not be visible. Now, doing this for planes like one, two, three, or four, five, six would be difficult. So the way we work out the intensity of the diffracted beam is as follows. Uh, F here is the amplitude of the waves uh, reflected by the HKL planes, the amplitude as opposed to the intensity. And that will be the sum of all the wa uh, waves reflected by each atom in the unit cell. And the coordinates of the atom in the unit cell are given by U with the subscript N for that particular atom and V with the subscript N and W with the subscript N and HKL is the particular plane that is doing the reflecting, okay? This is an atomic scattering factor. And just to give you um, uh, a memory aid, uh, whenever the exponent has an odd number of pi i's, i is the negative of, uh, uh, is the square root of uh, minus one. Whenever this is an odd number of pi i's, exponential of that equals minus one. And if this is even, then the uh, exponential gives us a plus one. So this is our cubic F, F lattice, and I'm going to use this equation for the one zero zero planes, right? And we have atoms located at four kinds of sites. These, this is the origin, zero, 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 and these are the three phase centers. 
Now let's assume all the atoms are identical, so this factor is the same for all. Then the amplitude of the diffracted beam is one. Uh, this corresponds to um, the origin, okay? So when we have zero, zero, zero here, exponential of that will clearly be just one. Now, we are looking at the one zero zero plane, so k is zero, and therefore this has an odd number of pi i's, and therefore that's equal to minus one. Similarly, l is zero, therefore this is minus one, and this is zero and this is zero, so this is plus one. So plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, you get zero intensity. So this is a, a simple calculation you can do for any particular set of HKL planes. And intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Okay, so that is called a structure factor equation and helps you to work out the intensities of the various, um, various beams. Now we looked at the Bragg equation and we demonstrated that when the Bragg equation is satisfied, that means the phase difference between this and this is equal to an integral number of wavelengths, we get constructive interference and that defines the Bragg angle, uh, which in a perfect crystal, we should only get intensity at that angle. And we demonstrated that when there is, a, a, when um, the incident beam deviates from the Bragg angle, the reflected beams progressively get out of phase until somewhere in the depth of the crystal, you find a wave which is exactly half a wavelength out of phase and therefore you kill that uh, by destructive interference. So the phrase somewhere within the depth of crystal is important because what that means is that if we have a thin crystal, okay, then we will not get destructive interference even if, uh, even if we are deviating from theta. So effectively, you're picking up intensity even though you're not at the Bragg angle if your crystal is not sufficiently thick. Okay. Now, in the reciprocal lattice, we, uh, in the Evasphere construction, we represent this by uh, supposing we are looking at a thin foil as we would do in a transmission electron microscope. Typically, the foil is about uh, 100 nanometers or less in thickness. So it is thin in one direction. So if we artificially extend the reciprocal lattice points in the direction normal to the foil plane, then we effectively reproduce the, um, reproduce the fact that we need a thick crystal in order to get diffraction perfectly at theta, but if we have a thin crystal, we will get diffracted intensity even when we are not at the Bragg angle. So we extend these reciprocal lattice points to reflect one upon the thickness of the foil. So now the Avar sphere is able to intersect more reciprocal lattice points. So you get a diffraction pattern which has spots which are not exactly at Bragg uh, Bragg orientation. And you might even pick up the reflections from the second layer, uh, from a second layer of the reciprocal lattice because of the curvature of the sphere. We are getting this and this, nothing in the middle here, and then suddenly we get the second uh, layer zone. So here is a diffraction pattern showing that. First of all, we have the diffracted beams from the layer passing through the origin and then nothing much and we get strong intensity further away from the origin because we are picking up reflections from other layers which don't pass through the origin of the reciprocal lattice. Okay, so this effectively gives you a three-dimensional electron diffraction pattern. Now here is uh, an illustration of what happens when you go from a, a relatively thick foil to a relatively thin foil. So here we are intersecting a couple of these reciprocal lattice points, but no diffraction from these. 
and therefore we get pairs of uh, reciprocal lattice points. If I make my thin foil thinner, these spikes in reciprocal space become longer, and therefore I pick up more diffracted intensity. Okay? So this is quite important that when we are looking in a transmission electron microscope, it's much easier to get the diffraction than if you're looking in uh, with a bulk specimen in X-ray diffraction where you will get diffraction only close to the Bragg angle. What this also means is that electron diffraction as shown here will be less accurate because we can get um, intensity even when we are not at the Bragg angle. And there are other techniques for much better accuracy in electron diffraction, which I'm not going to discuss. This uh, shows the effect of tilting the beam relative to the crystal. So here, the beam is symmetrical with respect to this reciprocal lattice layer. So we get intensity on both sides. In this case, uh, you can see that the incident beam has been tilted relative to this. And therefore, we are not getting anything from this side, but more spots on this side. So this appears like a rather strange electron diffraction pattern uh, because it's tilted from the exact 111 beam direction. Now, when we talk about thickness, uh, of course, we have precipitates inside a crystal. And those precipitates uh, often form as very thin plates, for example. And that, in effect, will give you a broadening of the reciprocal lattice points coming from those precipitates. So this, these are very fine plate-like precipitates. There's also plates in the plane of the foil, which, which are these diffuse disks. And because these precipitates are very thin, their reciprocal lattice points are extended quite a lot and we get effectively these diffraction streaks corresponding to the um, fact that these are not thick precipitates, okay? So we can get uh, streaking in electron diffraction patterns when the precipitates inside your foil are actually very fine. Now the same sort of principle applies to X-ray diffraction if you're looking at powders. If your particle is reasonably large, then you get sharp diffraction peaks. But if your particle is extremely small, uh, nanometers in size, then those peaks will broaden because you're not able to find beams which will cancel out uh, by destructive uh, interference because there isn't sufficient depth in that crystal when you deviate from the Bragg angle. Now, X-rays uh, in, in uh, the normal X-rays that we use uh, in laboratory scenarios penetrate the material roughly 10 micrometers, okay? And electron diffraction, of course, is limited uh, to electron transparency. It's limited by electron transparency to thin foils of the order of uh, 100 nanometers thick. But supposing that I wanted actually to probe a large sample. So this is an image of a, a welded material. Here we have a weld deposit, and this is a steel plate, which is 10 millimeters thick by uh, quite long. Uh, I should mention that uh, if you use synchrotron X-rays, you can pe penetrate a few millimeters of steel. But I really want more than a few millimeters. So in this case, we can use neutrons. Uh, okay, you obviously need a reactor and these reactors are available at various parts in the world where you can book time. If you're an academic, you can book time freely if you have a good case, scientific case, uh, and do measurements to much greater depths because neutrons can penetrate to much greater depths because they are not charged particles. And the second advantage of uh, neutro neutrons is that the scattering factor doesn't uh, correlate with the atomic weight. So for example, um, two species, uh, uh, nickel, uh, nickel one and nickel two, two isotopes, would not be possible to differentiate by using X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction. But those isotopes might have quite different uh, scattering factors for neutrons. So we can, we can study things in which 
you know, the atomic species are quite close to each other or even get diffraction from very light elements like carbon. So in some cases, you know, the crystal structures of carbides have been determined somewhat incorrectly because by actual diffraction, you don't pick up the positions of the carbon atoms. When you use neutron diffraction, you can show that they are located at specific sites and then you, you, you get a different symmetry for those carbides. Now, this is uh, the, the crystal structure, cubic F, of a nickel aluminum solid solution. Uh, so each one of these gray atoms represents some sort of an average nickel and aluminum atom. And in terms of scattering intensity, we would, uh, we would not pick up 001 type planes because uh, of uh, what I explained earlier. So this reflection here, for example, would be a 0, 0, 002 and 0 bar 20 and 220. This is a cubic F lattice. All right? This uh, is the case when the aluminum and nickel atoms order. So these atoms are no longer identical. And therefore, this becomes a primitive cubic lattice. And we are able to pick up the 100 the 110 and 010 reflections. Now you might ask why are these less intense than this? And the reason is that uh, these reflections, if you use your structure factor equations, you intensity proportional, uh, intensity proportional to the square of the difference of the scattering powers of the nickel and aluminum atoms, the difference, okay? Whereas this reflection 002 uh, sums them up. So these reflections are known as super lattice reflections uh, of an ordered compound, and they will be weaker than the main reflections, uh, which you would pick up if the system was disordered. Okay, finally, uh, I'm going to go through an example where we do not know um, what this diffraction pattern is, and we are going to solve it. But to solve it, I need to, whoops, uh, but to solve it, I need to know the D spacings here, okay? So I look at, once again, my transmission electron microscope. This is the incident beam, diffracted beam, and this is the angle two theta. This is the distance from the electron gun to the sample, the length L, okay, uh, of the column of the microscope effectively. And R is the distance you measure between the origin and a reciprocal lattice point on your diffraction pattern. Now, remember that two theta is very small for electron diffraction. It's of the order of one degree or less. So you can say that sine two theta is about the same as two sine theta. And if, if I look at this triangle here, then I can say sine of theta is equal to r upon 2 divided by l. Sorry, that s should be a 2. Okay, and therefore 2 sine theta is equal to r over l, and sine 2 theta is equal to r over l, given that we are using this approximation. Now, from the Bragg equation, we get sine 2 theta equals lambda upon d. So we can equate these two terms and write the D spacing as the camera length lamp, which is a product of the wavelength and this length here, divided by the spacing that we measure on the electron diffraction pattern from the origin to the, uh, um, to the diffracted spot. So uh, we now go on to solve that diffraction pattern. Uh, so this is the diffraction pattern. Uh, ignore these. This is after we have indexed it. We measure this distance r. We know the camera constant, okay? Uh, and uh, therefore we can work out the d spacings for these spots. And if you know the lattice parameter, we can create a list of d spacings, compare, and therefore start to index these. So this one, for example, I would start to index as 002 if it happened to have a spacing which is 
1.78 angstroms. Uh, and this one I would label as 111 because it's closer to the origin and the spacing greater than 402. Uh, uh, D spacing greater, therefore, um, in the reciprocal space, it will be closer to the origin. And then I verify that this angle here actually is what I should expect if I take a dot product between these two, which is 54.74. So once you've done that, once you've labeled one spot, another spot consistently with, uh, with the d-spacings uh, or one upon the d-spacings, and you discover that the angle is correct, the problem is solved and everything else follows just by a linear combination of these two vectors. Now, supposing you don't know the camera constant and the only information that you have, so you don't know this camera constant, you don't know lambda L, and the only information you have is that, you know, it, you know that it's from copper with a certain lattice parameter. Then you could also work out the ratios here of the 1 on 1 reflect, uh, G vector divided by the O2 G vector and create another column here, which is 1 upon D and see if those ratios match, then index them and check for consistency between the angles. Okay, so you can, you can label it without any knowledge of the camera constant, if you have uh, the lattice parameter and you guess what they are by looking at the ratios of these lengths. Now, with a modern electron microscope and certain facilities, you can actually measure diffraction patterns at many, many different orientations and create a three-dimensional diffraction pattern which I'm going to show you now. So this looks like a nightmare, but actually it is a three-dimensional electron diffraction pattern. And, you know, obviously this is useful when you're doing some sort of computer analysis of the distribution of crystals and, and so on. Okay. So this is possible to do and you know, there, there are facilities for automating this as well. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. <laughs>